Great, now we've got to Union. And it's important to realize that Union wasn't only a geographical construct, it was also very significantly a cultural con construct. And this cultural construct put together the Boers and the British near the twain shall meet. So the Union period is significantly that period between 1910 at the time of Union and 1961, which is when South Africa became a republic. It unified the provinces of Natal, which was self-ruled under the British, the Cape of Good Hope under the British, the Orange Free State, which was a Dutch Boer uh, colony, and the Transvaal, which was also a Dutch Boer colony. And generally, the people in Natal were opposed to union. They didn't want to get into bed with all of these other other sort of disparate parties. And what Union did was that it provided for centralized government. So when the different colonies of which made up Union went into um, to forming the Union, it meant that the government was centralized literally in Pretoria. So economic, economic challenges such as the anglo Boer War, now called the South African War, locusts, which happened um, repeatedly between the late um, 1890s and the early 20th century. East Coast fever, which was a ravaging cattle disease, which was continuously um, um, challenging for farmers, particularly Dutch farmers who, who farmed cattle, as we noted before. And then also the Bambata uprising. And we've spoken about the Bambata uprising um, in, in, the, in the last section and the financial financial implications of the Bambata uprising for the colony of Natal. So all of these led to the consolidation of territories and the formation of Union in May. So this meant that the British colony, Natal colony, Orange Free State, which was Boer, Zuid-Afrikaanse Republic, which was Boer, all entered into Union. And in order to celebrate this, a brand new building was constructed um, opened in 1911, um, and this was the Union buildings in, in Pretoria, which were um, designed by famed architect Sir Herbert Baker. So for governance, this, this meant that the country as a whole remained an independent British territory. All significant governance moved to Pretoria as the official capital, Bloemfontein as the legal capital, and then Parliament in Cape Town. And what is absolutely vitally important was Natal was left out of the official loop. And you will find, once you get to understand the region, that Natal is and has historically been the leftover relative in the understanding of, of the whole um, the whole sort of uh, conceptual idea of South Africa. And this also meant diminishment of provincial powers for Natal province, and their allegiance remained strongly British, even though they were now part of this entire national union. This also meant that English and High Dutch were both situated as official languages, um, the architecture reflected Union, being a mixture of Dutch and British architectural influences. With British, this was largely Edwardian, and for the Dutch, Cape Dutch architecture with the use of teak Dutch windows and doors and white painted walls. This political architectural melange continued for decades. And then we find that Art Deco also filtered into Durban in the late 1930s, reflecting a... Um, reflecting a, a, a building boom, as well as an arts and crafts and Tudor Beethan revival, which reflected quite significant post-war nationalism in England. And so that very strong connection between, um, between pr particularly the province of Natal and England remained. So the most important, probably the founding piece of legislation, which um, was later sort of pulled in under the umbrella of apartheid was a thing called the Native Land Act, which was promulgated in um, 1913. And the Native Land Act um, is the, basically it, 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 it restricted the types of land that African people could own. It didn't, it didn't restrict 
African purchase of land in its totality, as is often what you may hear. Um, it restricted the types of land that Africans would own, and it also restricted access to land. Um, and the 1913 Land Act is the fundamental piece of legislation which underpins the national um, land claims process, which continues to undergo um, for the last 20 years. And if you remember Chief Langa Libelele and his daughters went off to Edendale and lived on the mission station, and he had sons on the mission station, namely Henry Selby and Richard M. Samung, and these two particular individuals um, were literate, they were part of the Amakolwa, um, and they were part of the formation of what was called the Natal Native Congress in 1912, which really um, took this intended legislation to heart and went to a famed meeting in Bloemfontein in the same year at which the the foundations of the ANC were laid. And so not only did the Natal land or the, the native the Native Land Act form the impetus for the formation of the ANC at the very beginning, but Natal residents, Natal Africans were very much involved in that process itself. And then England declared war on Germany, and as with all the other colonies, South Africa participated in the war. And many, many people, um, largely men, um, a mixture of races, so it wasn't necessarily only white men, but many, many South African men participated either directly in war or indirectly in war. And perhaps the most important story of World War I for South Africans is the, the Mendi. And this was a, a ship, as in the image below, and this particular ship was carrying on it largely Klossa sailors. Um, they were sunk in 1917, I think it was, off the coast of Britain by a British, um, by a British ship. And this caused quite a bit of a hush-up, but at the same time, documents relating to this are still located in the archives, but this particular um, oral history about the Mendi um, is really quite poignant um, with the the extreme sort of um, African response which came out of of um, of the ship of the ship sinking. Um, and so the Mendi is one of these things which in recent years has undergone restitution in terms of its memorialization. So 1918, South Africa also was participant in the Spanish flu. Very, very interestingly, there is very little memory of the Spanish flu, which I find an absolutely fascinating historical construct. But also at the end of war, um, Louis Boerter, who was the first prime minister of the Union of South Africa, died. And into his shoes stepped a guy called Jan Christian Smuts. Now, young Christian Smuts was a good friend of King George. He was a scholar. In fact, he'd, he'd undertaken university studies in England. He was a very bright man, and he ruled South Africa from time to time between 1919 and 1948. Um, and his allegiance with Britain in particular was something to which many Afrikaners in the Union of South Africa took umbrage. After the war, as with everywhere else in the world, there were all sorts of disturbances, specifically the 1922 miners' strikes on the reef, and this was this was in relation to miners feeling, feeling dispossessed because black Africans were coming in to start taking their jobs and they were feeling threatened as far as their work was concerned. So these impacts of war on the home society existed. Um, the 1923 Native Areas Urban Act was promulgated and this basically meant that any Africans who were not given passes to live in town had to have passes to be resident in town, um, that these had to be ratified by white employers and that there was a curfew um, which um, each city or each town imposed and 
people had to be off the streets or black people have to be, had to be off the streets after a certain hour. And this was in 1923. In 1925, Afrikaans was recognized as a language on its own, thereby supplanting High Dutch. And 1926, Natal colony, or Natal province rather, undertook an assessment of native chiefs. And this was to pretty much get a jolly good idea as to exactly who was located um, where and being able to have a good assessment as to, to what the impacts were. Um, of further further sort of land issues would be. And in 1927, the Immorality Act, which was another one of the pieces of exclusionary legislation, was passed. And the Immorality Act was quite important because this actually criminalized um, the marriage or sexual relations between white people and people of other colors and the immorality act was one of the one of the legislations which lasted until much of the apartheid legislations were dismantled in the late um in in the early 1990s so i didn't really mention the indians in the first section and i think it's really important to give quite a good understanding to the role of of Indians in the protest in the protest um, scenario in South Africa. So, from about 1860, um, ships arrived from India carrying a mixture of passenger Indians, which were people who were businessmen, but also indentured Indians. And um, indentured Indians were brought across to Natal specifically to work originally on the tea plantations, but into in sugar. Um, the idea of indenture was picked up by some of the sugar barons of Natal when they had um, gone across to Mauritius, which used indentured Indians for much of much of the sugar labor. And indentured Indians typically had about a five-year indenture, after which they could be re-indentured. And after um, a number of years, companies such as Tongard Hewlett, for example, actually gave people land after their indenture completed. And so you find that the, the sort of coastal areas of KwaZulu-Natal today are um, quite densely populated with very small plots of land which have been fragmented from some of these original few acre grants. But anyway, one of the sort of significant people who came um, came out at the end of the 19th century was um, was a man called Mahatma Gandhi, Mohandas Karachat Gandhi. And he was a young lawyer who set up home in um, in Inanda, very close to celebrated other resistance luminaries such as John Dubé and also Isaiah Shembe after 1904. And um, Gandhi was, was very well known for starting his protest um, protest principle, which actually started when he was thrown off a train in Peter Maritzburg for insisting that he wasn't going to sit in the second class seats. And this really set into pace a series of resistance campaigns led by Indians and also um, promoted by Indians against some of the exclusionary legislation which affected Indian people specifically. And so this this really was quite an important background to what was the Salt March in 1930. And the Salt March was a march led by Gandhi against many of the Asiatic um many of the Asiatic exclusionary clauses which were part of the um part of the legislations which became exclusionary at the beginning of the 20th century. So the 1930s, like pretty much everywhere else in the world, were years of depredation and disaster. The Wall Street crash and the Great Depression also affected communities across the whole of South Africa. And traders who were running trading stores, which worked with rural communities, particularly speak of how they extended lines of credit to rural people in the middle of nowhere whose crops had all died and whose cattle had all died. And in addition, in Natal particularly, there was a very significant malaria outbreak, and this led to all sorts of legislations which um, were moving towards um, demolition of informal dwellings, promoted around the fact that these 
harbored um, the Anopheles mosquito in a lot of the time pools of pools of water or um, pit latrines. And so the the health aspects of the late 1920s, early 1930s also led to quite significant demolition of buildings and moving of people into formal housing, which has also um, retrospectively been seen as potential um, potential forced removals with an apartheid lens. So not all of the stuff which happened in the colonies and in the area pre nineteen um, between 1994 were actually uh, politically motivated. So if we start looking at moving towards separation, um, Van Vamelo, who was the government ethnographer, undertook a massive work on the ethnic groups in South Africa in 1935-1936, and he mapped every single clan. It was an absolutely phenomenal piece of work because it meant that across the whole of South Africa, there was a clan-level understanding as to who existed where and what the notional boundaries were, constructed or otherwise. And this was information which fed into the Native Trust and Land Act of 1936, which was very, um, which was very, it sort of built on the 1913 Act. And significantly, one of the things which this particular document sought to do was aggressively get land from white farmers in order to be able to find extra land on which to settle Africans. And... Um, so the, the two sides of some of these legislations are not necessarily interrogated, but the Native Trust and Land Act certainly was more about being able to increase the locations for black settlement rather than to necessarily, um, rather than to let necessarily minimize access to land. So it was about being able to facilitate moving of people into, into bounded areas. So Native Trust Lands, so from 1849 under the administration of the Secretary for Native Affairs, the Native Trust Lands were basically those areas which were locations and then in Zululand they were named reserves. Um, but these were administered by chiefs of the tribal courts through the Natal Code of Native Law, which we learned a bit earlier in the lecture. And these were registered in what was called the Natal Native Trust. And after 1936, these were re-registered in the South African Native Trust um, because the, the, um, the, the registration of the physical trust in order to be able to accommodate these lands was created. And then much later on, sort of towards the 1980s, um, they were re-registered in the South African Development Trust. So all of these lands were areas set aside for black rule, some, some of them since 1849. And significantly, after the, um, after the 1994 elections, these were incorporated into what is called the Ngonyama Trust under the aegis of the king of um of um the zulu um until very recently king goodwill zulatini and monies from tribute and rents from these particular trust lands didn't go back to the south african development trust or didn't go back to the natal native trust for administration of the lands but rather they cascaded into the Ingonyama trust coffers and this is an incredibly difficult piece of legislation to unpick um, in order to be able to give people equitable access to land in current day KwaZulu-Natal. Okay, so the 1930s really reflected a very similar type of nationalism as was experienced in Germany in the, in the 1930s with the rise to power of Hitler in 1933. And this was reinforced in South Africa by the participation in the 1936 Olympics by a boxer named Roby Labrandt, who was very closely associated with Afrikaner nationalism in South Africa and his associations with the Nazi party in Germany. Um, but the Afrikaner nationalism was really demonstrated quite strongly with the opening of the Fortreka monument outside Pretoria, um, which celebrated the 100th anniversary of the Great Trek. And if you remember, the Great Trek was that whole movement of Dutch cattle farmers from the Cape 
up into the interior and then also coming into Natal in 1838. And as you can see here, this was an absolutely pivotal moment in the just pre-war um, uh, sympathies of many people in the country. At the same time, I've already mentioned Jan Smuts, who was the, the the Prime Minister at the time, and I've mentioned that Jan Smuts was a good friend of King George, and being a good friend of King George, and being one of the colonial um, entities of, of the British Commonwealth, uh, South Africa was compelled to go into war. And so there was much um, much antagonism about the participation of South Africans in World War II because they felt that they were fighting King George's war and not necessarily a war which was anything to do with, with us at the southern tip of Africa. So World War II had implications in allegiance with the different fascist parties, and the fascist parties is not only those that in Germany, but also that in Italy. And the impact of the war also had quite significant um, ramifications for a whole variety of different people within South Africa itself. In KwaZulu-Natal, or in Natal, Natal um, province as it was then, um, white men went off to war, and generally speaking, um, contrary to what happened in, in, in Europe, um, African men took over their, their roles in industry rather than women. Um, women took up quite a lot of the, the backstop in South Africa. German communities particularly and some Italian communities were put under house arrest because of their potential links with people in Europe. But also the war itself is really quite a legend. It's, it was quite a, a seminal moment for communities in, in Natal province. And I remember meeting a very, very old man in the late late 1990s in the center of Zululand and he had come back from the war he'd served in the war um on obviously on the, on the side of the south africans he'd been caught, he'd been caught by italians he'd been an italian prisoner of war he'd escaped through the snow and he'd eventually made it back to south africa and his um his his experience on going back to the center of Zululand and telling people that he'd been traveling under the sea when people had never heard of a submarine with all of these different stories really meant that his return to South Africa with all of these experiences landed on quite strange ears for some of the people amongst whom he lived. And so participation in the war reinforced local anti-British fervour, and this resulted in the installation of the Nationalist Party in 1948. And so basically, because Jan Smuts had been so focused on participating in, in England's war, the Nationalists literally swept in and when he wasn't looking and took over the rule of the country. So this 1948 moment really brought in um, the really big swathe of separationist legislation. And the stuff that I've put down here is the tip of the iceberg of legislation which, um, which promoted white people over black, Indian, coloured, whatever. So the Afrikaner support for the Nationalist Party meant that the Nationalist Party was voted into power. Past laws for African women were instituted in 1952, and this meant that African women needed to carry passes in order to be able to access cities, as with um, the Native Areas Urban Act in 1923. This led to a series of minor resistances, or actually quite major resistances, I suppose, in retrospect, one being the Congress of the People in 1955, out of which came the seminal document being the Freedom Charter. And the Freedom Charter really considered that power to the people was absolutely fundamental and that the people should govern. And so that these became these became the sort of founding statements of a much stronger 
um, coordinated resistance against the, the ruling Nationalist Party. And because the people or the signatories to the Freedom Charter were not white, um, this operated pretty much underground for a significant period of time. The Group Areas Acts continue to be promulgated 1950, 1955 and 1966 as I remember and these Group Areas Acts were reasons to be able to move people around, move white people from newly declared black areas or Indian areas, move Indian people from black areas to new Indian areas, move black people from Indian areas and white areas to black areas. It's a real, real organisational mess. So the Freedom Charter in 1955, um, coming out of the the um, Congress of the People, was followed quite quickly by the Women's March in 1956. And the Women's March in 1956 was a united women's um, protest, black, white, Indian, coloured women protesting about the need to carry passes. This was then followed by Sharpeville, which was a massacre of something like 69 people in 1960. And the Sharpeville massacre was um, the police carrying out an armed resistance against about 7,000 protesters. And the Sharpeville massacre was the last straw that broke the camel's back as far as being part of the Commonwealth was concerned. And so in 1961, South Africa became a republic. And so the Re Republic of South Africa divorced divorced itself from colonial membership. It adopted the South African rand as the currency and went off the pound. It also ramped up exclusionary legislation. And as a result, the ANC moved into exile. And so the ANC continued to work very strongly as an underground movement uh, from countries bordering um, contemporary South Africa. This was also the beginnings of forced removals in earnest. And this was when the group Areas Acts were taken very seriously and people were moved accordingly. So not a hell of a lot happened before, before South Africa became a republic. And in order to be able to support the apartheid era's um, nationalist wants, conscription was um, started in 1967. So every white male had to take up arms for a period of between six months which then became a year which then became two years um, until the uh, late 1980s but conscription was really men going to battle against the ANC and their allies which were largely um, largely communist countries bordering South Africa. The next really really major impact was the Soweto riots of 1976 and this was again another uprising in Soweto and it was literally shooting of, of school children who were protesting against having to learn Afrikaans which was obviously the the language of um language of the nationalist party and um so so this this particular moment was very significant in the move towards the, the, the dismantlement of apartheid. Followed swiftly by the death of Steve Biko in 1977, which also really, these two events really brought the plight of South Africa to international, um, into international, uh, into the international realm. So the dismantling of apartheid sort of started with the release of Mandela in 1989. Um, negotiations were made through something called the Conference for a Democratic South Africa between 1990 and 1993 as to how South Africa would be able to have a transitional government and move from um, whites only votes to um, being able to allow for a democratic government. This was followed in 1992 by what was called the Yes No referendum and I remember voting in the yes no referendum which was for whites only and the yes no referendum was are we ready to move towards democracy and open up voting to everybody or not so that was something which really was quite quite a big point in my reasonably young life then followed by the death of chris harney in 1993 which further put South Africa on the international stage and ramped up the anti-apartheid movements abroad. Um, 
in order to be able to support the move towards to more of a democratic South Africa. And then on the 27th of April 1994, the first democratic elections were won by the African National Congress. And now we get to 25 years later. So South Africa, I think, is really a young adult. And in a lot of ways, it's a really good way to start thinking of South Africa being almost like a human in terms of their development and their priorities and their challenges. And the first few years of the, the new republic, the democratic republic, was considered as the construct of the rainbow nation and also the construct of Ubuntu. And so there was an incredibly large amount of, um, of effort in putting together some form of social cohesion. And at the same time, we had first class legislation because it is new. And in order to be able to contextualize this, I was part of the crafting of legislation, provincial legislation for the province of KwaZulu-Natal in about 1997. And when we did that legislation, it was absolutely first class around the world because it drew on contemporary legislation from everywhere. And at the same time, as a young adult, it's had teething problems. The country has had to reprioritize in order to support the masses and also to be able to put into place all sorts of new economic frameworks, which it demonstrably has to work together. And at the same time, the priorities of housing, health and education are there in order to support um, a largely D, 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 or mar previously marginalized population, which didn't have necessarily equitable access to all of these and certainly economies. And the most important thing is the fluxes and flows of contemporary life in South Africa is really about creating a common identity. And this is done constantly through negotiation and renegotiation and resilience. And these things are what make South Africa a really exciting place to live in. My final comments in this particular lecture are that it's really, really difficult to put together a reasonably balanced, reasonably democratic, reasonably around facing history of the province of KwaZulu-Natal. I tried to focus on, on KwaZulu-Natal specifically because that is the area that, um, that you will be focusing on. But it's really important to forgive me if I missed out some items or didn't foreground some items which may well have been better, better placed. So thank you for listening and I hope that this gives you some sort of rather rambling and garbled understanding as to what the complex history of the province that you'll be working in is. Thank you for listening.